Hi everyone and welcome to this video on academic skills. In this particular video, I'm going to be discussing one of the fundamental building blocks of research, and that is the research question. So I'm going to start us off by showing you what a good research question actually entails. What do we need as ingredients to make a research question work? Then I'm going to give you a couple of examples of questions that don't quite work to talk about how we can make them better. And in the end, I'm going to leave you with a bit of advice on what to avoid as you're putting together your own research questions. So let's dive right in. Let's say you're trying to get a research project off the ground, whether it's a short research paper, a graduate thesis, or something much larger. Any such project starts with a good question, something that sparked your curiosity. It helps to think about your topic in terms of the famous five W's, which are who, what, when, where, and why. Oh, and how, I suppose. So really five W's in one H. Well, you know what I mean. The thing is, while starting with a basic question word or two is an excellent way to wrap your head around a problem or a puzzle, it isn't quite the same as formulating a research question. It can be a good starting point, but it's not yet enough. So let's take a look at the basic qualities of a good research question. What has to go into such a question to make it work? Well, I can think of seven things, so let me go through them one by one. The first is relevance. Your question has to speak to some broader concern that is worth tackling. That is true whether you're working on issues like contemporary politics or the meaning of historical sources that are a thousand years old. Your question should deal with a pressing concern, something that speaks to debates that are not yet settled, or some mystery that hasn't been fully solved. That's then already closely related to the second important quality of a good research question. It has to be interesting. That means that if you're just retreading over old ground or dealing with a topic that really won't get anyone excited, then you're probably going to need to rethink your project. Don't start with a question that threatens to put you to sleep. Because if you're bored to death with your question, then your audience will be bored too, whether it is your supervisor or assessor who has to go over your work, a group of conference participants will have to listen to you present your topic, or the readers of that journal where you're hoping to publish your paper. If your topic doesn't answer the all-important question of, so what, then it probably won't generate very interesting research questions. The next point on my list is the scope of your question. You have to find the right measure for your topic. At what scale are you looking at the problem? If you pick a question that is far too broad, like how do politics work in Asia, or how can we solve global environmental degradation, then it's unlikely that you'll be able to truly answer that question. On the other hand, if your question is too narrow, for instance, because it asks how one particular source represents one specific event, then that might not be enough to make your project speak to wider concerns. This is also why it is unwise to pose a closed question, so a question that can be answered with a single factoid or with a simple yes or no answer. A question like, who is the Prime Minister of Japan, is not a research question, and neither is, does the Huangpu River flow through Shanghai? So make sure you balance the scope of your question in a way that makes it possible to actually tackle it, but without narrowing the focus so much that the answer becomes trivial. Another important quality of a good research question is that it should be informed by wider academic debates. That is why successful research projects usually start with a period of extensive literature review. You need to get a sense of what others have written on your subject. Maybe your initial question has already been answered. Maybe it led to new and more specific questions that can now be tackled. Maybe there's a gap in the literature where you can situate your own work. To find out whether that is the case, you have to follow the trail of scholarship that has dealt with the topic. You may even have to do some original research of your own, for instance a pilot study, so that you can adjust your research question in an informed way. In fact, research questions are often live documents, in that they change and get refined throughout the early phases of a project. This is also why it is somewhat disingenuous when university programs or research funding bodies demand fully-fledged research proposals from their applicants. At least in much of the humanities and social sciences, in order to create such a proposal, and especially the research question, you have to have effectively already conducted a large chunk of the research. The next point on my list is clarity. Your audience must be able to understand the question you are posing. It has to be clear what you mean. This may seem self-evident, but it's actually quite difficult to get the balance right between an informed, sophisticated research question that has the right scope and language that conveys those complexities in clear terms. 
For instance, if your question speaks to complicated academic debates that are bogged down in disciplinary jargon, you may be tempted to reproduce that jargon to flag that you are indeed appropriately informed. I'd urge you to resist that temptation. At the end of the day, even a complex research question needs to still be intelligible to someone who isn't a specialist in that field. You can contribute to the clarity of your question by making sure you formulate a phrase that has clear subjects and objects and, ideally, an active verb. Scholarship often uses complex passive clauses and lengthy chains of convoluted nouns, but this does not necessarily contribute to clarity. The next issue tends to be most difficult for beginning students. It's originality. I have already pointed out how a well-informed research question follows from gaps in the existing literature, how it addresses questions that have not yet been answered. But that can be a tall order indeed. If you are, for instance, just an undergraduate student uh, starting out on your scholarship, how can anyone really expect you to come up with something truly novel? You would need a far better grasp on the often sizable academic literature than most survey courses at that level are able to offer you. However, it is important to realize that originality does not have to mean coming up with something completely new. Sometimes originality simply means bringing a different angle to the topic. It can mean making debates speak to each other that have not previously been considered together. Or it can mean looking at a well-established topic using new materials. For example, it might be difficult to come up with an original research question on a topic like nationalism in East Asia, but what if a new Chinese movie lends itself to an analysis of nationalism? Or maybe a current affairs event has created a novel dynamic no one has looked at yet? Or possibly a group of nationalists keep making socioeconomic arguments about migration, but no economist has provided a reality check on those claims yet? If you were to bring in knowledge from that discipline of economics, you might be able to create a unique take on the subject. At the end of the day, originality doesn't mean inventing something new out of thin air, it means making the topic your own and contributing an angle that only you can provide. And finally, the seventh element that makes a good research question is that the question has to be practical. It has to already imply a way forward for answering it you should have at the back of your head some sense of the materials that can help you answer your question. And you should think about the tools you will use to work with those materials. Can your question be answered with the tools of, for example, a literature review? Or will you need to conduct your own empirical research? What methods would that entail? Would survey work solve your problem? And would you be able to realistically launch such a survey? Or maybe you'd want to interview people or observe their behavior in person but then you'll need to make sure that you have that kind of access. Or perhaps a specific kind of media analysis like a discourse analysis or visual analysis will help you answer your question. In that case, you have to make sure your approach for collecting the data is appropriate and that your research methods are feasible. You'll also want to make sure that the concepts that your question uses can actually be studied. Scholars would say you operationalize them. For instance, if you're asking about the legitimacy of political actors, you would have to clarify what you mean by legitimacy and how you would go about measuring such a thing. Only then can you go ahead and convincingly generate such a measure. So now that we have a better sense of what ingredients belong into a research question, let us take a look at some of the actual questions that I receive from students. I'm going to show you four of these. Some of them are actually quite close to what would work, but all of them have some kind of problem. So let's see if you can spot what those problems might be. Here is my first example for you. Again, a real question that a student was hoping to address in a project. It is, is China a communist country? Well, I think we can agree that this is an interesting topic and that it is highly relevant considering the incredible transformations that China has gone through in the past decade. However, the scope of the question is a problem. The fact that it can be answered with a simple yes or no answer makes this question too narrow. At the same time, it also risks being way too broad because it uses ill-defined terms like China and communist. I presume the focus is on the People's Republic of China here, but that is not entirely clear. It is also unclear what communism refers to exactly, and that suggests that the question is not yet well informed. The thing is, if you follow Marxist arguments, then there is no such thing as a communist country. Certainly not at this moment in time, because communism is the utopian destination to which all societies progress, supposedly, uh, and that they're supposed to arrive at after a transition from capitalism to socialism. 
So while we might ask whether the PRC is a socialist country, it makes very little sense to ask whether it is de facto communist. And then there's the question of practicality. How would we go about answering a question like this? What would even count as our evidence? So how can we start turning this into a more manageable question? Well, how about rephrasing it like this? To what extent does the PRC's socioeconomic system reflect the ruling party's communist ideology? This way we are now not talking about real existing communism, but rather about the ambitions of the Chinese Communist Party, which we can study by turning to clearly defined materials like for example its constitution or its propaganda. We also now have a better sense of where to explore the policies that have come out of that ideology, so in Chinese society and its economy. Granted, we still need to narrow down that element of our question, for instance by looking at specifically clearly defined case studies. We'd also need to say more about our practical approach for tracing such ideological influences on society and economics. But overall, this question now provides us with a much better starting point for our research. Here is a second example, this one about media and politics. The question is, what is the effect of the internet on China's political situation? So what do you make of that? Well, we can again tick the boxes for relevance and for tackling an interesting topic, but what does China's political situation really refer to? That's pretty vague and probably far too broad. Similarly, the internet is a term that can include a great many things. Are we talking about the web or the mobile internet or maybe a certain platform or app? We'll need to fix the scope here. It's then also an open question whether it is possible to measure and assess the kinds of effects that the question asks about. What would count as our evidence? So let's try this. What is the effect of Sina Weibo discussions about X on Chinese policy making? Again, the question is still too broad, but we're now moving in a much clearer direction. We know we will be studying media content on a specific platform, Sina Weibo, and we'll be doing so on a clearly defined topic, X. Depending on how we select that topic, we might already be able to identify specific policy making documents that we can then examine to get our answer. For instance, we could ask how trending hashtags on food safety issues in China during a particular time period compare to the health and safety policies that have come out in the immediate aftermath. Can we detect similar concerns in the policy documents as those that were raised in popular tweets? That's a much more manageable project. Let me show you a third example. The question here is, what kind of changes did China make to its foreign policy to drive the Chinese economy? So again, we would need to fix the scope. What time period are we talking about, for instance? But notice that there's another problem here. The question has an inbuilt assumption that isn't explained. That assumption is that foreign policy making had a specific intention and that this intention was to create economic progress. While that may be so, we don't know for sure. In fact, we can never really know what anyone's true intentions were. So it's probably best to drop such an assumption and refocus the question on something we can actually figure out in practice. Here's an alternative. What role did foreign policy play in Chinese economic development during the early reform era? That's much better. Now we can study foreign policy choices, for instance through historical records or official documents, and we can compare our findings with economic developments. We can study those by looking at GDP data and the way in which foreign trade and investment have shaped GDP during a given period of time. Granted, we'd still have to define a clear time period and we'd have to make a convincing case about the causal link between the policies and the economic effects, but we are much sounder footing now than we were before. Let's move on to one final example. The question here is, what influences could the Belt and Road Initiative have on the economic relations of other Asian countries with the European continent? So what do you make of that? Well, if you're worried about the scope, you'd be right. Which other Asian countries are we talking about? And the European continent is broad indeed. All of that will need to be more specific. But maybe most importantly, this question cannot currently be answered. Can you spot why? The answer is the modal verb could. Almost anything could or might happen, but can we ever be certain? So you might say, let's change the verb to will. What influence will the BRI have? 
But we're still on very thin ice with that kind of question because it's future-oriented and predictions are hard to make. In fact, I would go as far as saying that it is impossible to predict developments in complex systems like our human societies, their politics, and their economics. How do we fix this question? Well, how about this? How has the BRI shaped economic relations between the EU and three Asian economies, Pakistan, India, and Kazakhstan? Now we know what the European continent refers to in practice, and we can study EU policy and EU economic developments. Also, we now have a clear idea of the Asian trade partners that are relevant to our study. Sure, we'd still have to demonstrate that this is an informed choice, for instance because Pakistan is a major supporter of the BRI, India is a major critic, and Kazakhstan is a more mid-sized partner that relies heavily on both Chinese and European economic relations. But that is something that a solid literature review could establish. For now, we have a useful question to get our project on the road. Let me conclude with a few pieces of advice. As these examples have already illustrated, there are a few things you should generally avoid when you formulate a research question. At the top of my list are predictions on modalities, any questions about intentions and motivations that we don't know about for certain, simple yes and no questions, and any questions that contain a bias, for instance a hidden assumption or a normative judgment. An issue you don't necessarily have to avoid, but which is notoriously difficult to tackle, is causality. In complex social relations, causality is almost impossible to prove, and even professional researchers tend to be very careful and use advanced statistical operations to assess what might or might not be a causal link. Unless you are well trained in such methodologies, you'd probably be best advised to avoid questions about influences and causality. And I realize that some supervisors push their students to ask why questions in their projects, since those are some of the most intriguing questions there are, but I myself worry that this sets students up for failure. I'd much rather recommend asking a how question or exploring to what extent something is true rather than getting tempted by tricky calls or questions. But at the end of the day, it's up to you and possibly your supervisor whether you want to give such a project a shot. Finally, a great way to set up a question is to create a comparison. For instance, you might ask, how the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party compared to those of the former Communist Party of the Soviet Union. What are some of the commonalities? What are the differences? Or you could ask how the Japanese government handled the COVID-19 crisis compared to the government of South Korea. These are excellent questions that immediately narrow down the focus to a specific case. That said, I'd still advise caution. First, you'd have to convincingly show that you are not comparing apples and oranges. Are your cases really comparable? You'd also have to make sure that you don't change too many variables as you pick your comparisons. For instance, you might vary the country context and compare Japan and South Korea, but if you now also vary the time frame or the type of crisis you're exploring, then that introduces too many variables. The trick is to pick cases that are as similar as possible with only clearly defined shifts or differences that you can then study systematically. So that makes comparative cases difficult to set up. I should also warn you that comparisons tend to take much more work than other types of studies. Instead of analyzing, for instance, just the Japanese government's response to COVID-19, you'd also have to study the response of the South Korean government, and then you'd have to compare the two, which makes effectively three studies in one. So unless you're writing a graduate thesis, I'd be very careful setting up a study of that magnitude. That concludes this short video on research questions. Thank you for watching. I hope that you found the information here helpful. If you're interested in learning more about the kind of work that I do, feel free to check out my website politicseastasia.com and I will see you in another video.